Yes, Rick. Yes. Uh, this is kind of a, a long one. Um, so um, some of the best homeopaths, Lipe, Herring, Wells, Guernsey, Nash, um, considered to be some of the best practitioners to have ever lived. Um, and you especially hold Lipe to be above all else, uh, especially uh, a very accurate prescriber, great homeopath. When one reads the old journals and the works of these homeopaths, um, we're struck by several facts. One is they often start a case by um, starting with a high and, and sort of an odd potency, like an 87M. Um, so I'm wondering why, why we see that, why they, why they did that. Uh, also, um, they had a tendency more to wait and watch in cases of chronic disease, like give one dose and, and wait a, you know, a month or more um, before the next follow-up. And they were very successful. So you know, given their rate of success, why now are you teaching a more um, aggressive posology approach? Okay, so there's many aspects to your question. So let's start, I, I, I may not remember all of them, so we'll start with the first one. You said, why do you use uh, high potency to start a case? Okay, because that was a, a, a time that they were, um, you have to understand the, the, the evolution of uh, posology. Hahnemann, you know, uh, with the fifth edition, that's what the homeopathic world knew. They did not know about the sixth edition and the fifth edition. Most people were at, at stuck at the fifth edition. Fifth edition says the 30th potency is the best. Hahnemann, however, in his own practice, for the seven years before he died, seven or eight years before he died, he was systematically increasing the potency of his remedy. And if you look in his book, you'll see it would be doing the 150 potency and the next time would be 156 and the, like and then like say sulfur you'll see 186, 187, 188, the next day would be 108, it would just go up the potency for different patients. Eventually he was trying to stay mostly with 200. Two years before he died he developed the system of 50 millisimol to decrease the, the, um, the aggravation, the initial aggravation. So here there was there's always a search for the optimal posology, the best that, that will create the m fastest recovery with the less aggravation. Hahnemann died with the last word, uh, the, the last word on the posology, the 30th potency. Shortly after he died, Bunninghausen, Gross, and soon Lipe start to publish paper on higher potency. And the, uh, Burning Austin, the most faithful student or the closest to Hahnemann, he systematically prescribed 200 and he published that. Growth started to go to the 1M, 10M, 50M. <coughs> if we backtrack a bit, in 1831, uh, Korsakov in Russia sent remedy to Hahnemann of the 1500 potency. And, I'm in, and he published that in the uh, archives, the journal, and he said, uh, and Hanneman put a note there. He says, I agree with this potency, but there should be a limit. Otherwise, we will have no limit. So Hanneman kind of tried to keep things under control. He said there should be a limit. Anyway, Hanneman, th two years later, when he published the fifth edition, there was 30th potency was the, the optimal and also in chronic disease. Other, however, his faithful student, like Bonnie Nelson, comes with the 200 systematically with everybody. Gross started to go to the higher potency because he was aware of Korsakov. Lipe, uh, and then the Dienikins make the higher potency. He sends a set to Herring. Herring does not use it. He gives it to Lipe. Lipe says, yes, they work better than the 30th potency. Then there's a mathematician that comes into homeopathy. What was his name? Finke. Bernard Finke. He was a mathematician. He became a physician later. And he was, he was uh, a student of Maupertuis, which was a mathematician here, Maupertuis. And if you pay attention to Maupertuis, um, if you go look on the uh, Wikipedia, you'll see <coughs> the least action principle, the action, the principle of the least action. And this principle is still used in mathematics today. Okay? Now, from this and perhaps other knowledge that he knew maybe from Paracelsus, Finke in 1851 started to do 
deflection method of doing the remedy. In 55, about 14 years after he's doing the deflection, he comes out with this, he comes out with number of cure, I think there was 100 cases of cure, and with, uh, with higher potency. He gives a set to herring of his, of his fluxion and he gives it to Lipe. Herring does not use them. Again, herring kind of being more conservative, Lipe starts to use them because this is the real best that we have found in homeopathy. And Lipe used the pinky from 65, he died in 88. So it's for the last 23 years, it's all pinky. He tried, he tried the, the Skinners, he didn't like them so much, he stayed with the pinky all the time with the pinky. Continuous fluxion, so there's something to do with the fluxion. So now that was the time of Lippe. They came out, he was the one that uh, uh, used them, and the scale of, let's say, 200, 1M, 10M, 50M, TM, DM, MM, some people say the can't scale. It has nothing to do with can't. It was Pinky in the 60s that developed this, this scale. He's a mathematician. He was a mathematician. So he developed this scale. And uh, so, and the concept came with the IHA, the formation of the International Animal Association in 81 and before preceded that the idea was to find the minimal dose. Remember, you've seen that? There was the, the, the three bases of the IHA was uh, minimum, similimum, and um, hmm? Unum, yeah, unum, minimum, minimum. So the minimum was part of the concept that it had to be the minimal dose. So the concept here was to try the um, kind of the highest potency because it would be the minimal dose without, with, uh, without creating aggravation. So the idea is if you could give the minimum dose and as long as the patient is there, let it go. So there will be cases where um, chronic case that they would give one single dose. Why the odd potency of 87 M is because Pinky made odd potency. He made 45, 43 M, and some practitioners love those, those uh, between potency. They love them because it's, they felt, sometimes you give a, a odd potency to somebody and they have a great result, so, oh, I love that potency, but sometimes it's just for a remedy, it's just idiosyncrasy of the patient. It's the beginning of using of the high, the very high potency. So it's just one generation was using them. But now, since that time, we have much more ex information. Can you ask the second part of your question, Rick? Yeah. You have it right there. Yeah, I oh. So th this I explained to you a bit why they use the highest, okay. Yeah, thank you. Um, Oh, is there a part I didn't answer? No, I think that was good. Is that right? Yeah. Okay, so listen, maybe I, what I should add is will be the following. Since that time, we have much more information about the high potency. I mean, we have a, a, a s several generations have used a very high potency, and we know we can, the higher is the potency, the greater is the aggravation. So therefore, to start a case with an 87M, you have to be careful not to create a too great aggravation. We know that um, people that have disease, uh, that are ascending disease, you will, the, the, the remedy will be used up similarly as during an acute disease, the remedy will be used up more. So if you know that you're gonna have a, a, a person with, let's say, like yesterday, the muscular atrophy, the spine, that will be lifelong treatment, lifelong. We're gonna use the whole scale of remedy. Don't think to give a single dose and it will last for years. It will not work in that kind of case. But, and you will not see that kind of case in the uh, person who's giving an 87M who's better uh, for, uh, you know, without any further repetition. I think they gave us, a, a, the, the generation of Lipe gave us a very good basis <coughs> of, and, uh, and good experience of using the higher potency. But since that time we have, we have worked on their experience and we have went a bit beyond. I think now we cannot talk anymore about minimum dose, we have to talk about optimal, and when we talk about optimal, we talk about potency, repetition, and the way of administering the remedy. We're gonna have people of all kind of sensitivity and we have to adapt that, adapt the, the, the remedy the, in its uh, administration to each individual patient at each visit. 
So th they have a good experience. And uh, like I mentioned earlier this week, uh, there was this patient that was extremely sensitive. Give her a 6C in the maybe 1986, did a follow-up in 99, and give her a second remedy, a 6C. I talked to her about two weeks ago, didn't give her a remedy because she said, the, the remedy you give me in 99, it brought my energy up and it's still up and I don't need a remedy. I just want to ask you some questions. So I asked her, how have you been since that time? I said, I don't need, I just, my energy went up and I feel fine. So, but two doses of 6C since 1986, extremely sensitive. Yes, but this is her, this is her idiosyncrasy. The little girl with the spinal muscular atrophy, it's a completely different ball game. Later this week, we're gonna do a little boy with a, a, a brain tumor with about, I think he has 10 weeks to live or six weeks to live or three months to live with a brain tumor. It's a completely different. You'll have a person that is uh, older person that will have a broken down constitution, completely different. Somebody with a very acute disease, completely every situation will be different. So I hope this answers your question, Rick. Yes, it does. Um, and you started to answer the, I think the second part as well, but um, I'll just repeat it. So they, uh, these homeopaths also, you know, they had more of a tendency to watch and wait in, in the chronic diseases. So, um, you know, so I'm wondering what, given their, given their rate of success, can you explain why you now teach a more aggressive plusology approach? No, it no, like it's, you, it's um, not more aggressive. It's more appropriate, more individualized. Yeah. It's, we always say you start the case with one dose and you watch how long is the response. From there, then you can give your second dose and you watch how long is the response to the second dose. If the response is longer the second time, that means a good uh, 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 remedy of high degree of similarity. And then you have to prescribe the remedy as needed. So we do the same thing, wait and watch. But if they would publish a case, one case, of a person they wait, as, like let's say, I, if I, had, if I would publish, my only case I would publish would be the case that I saw in 1986, that I gave the remedy and I did a follow-up in 99 and in 2014 I do a, a, a follow-up but he said I don't need more remedy, I would give you a really false impression of my practice, right? Totally wrong impression. This is a particular patient and it will happen. This is unusual. Uh, if, if I give you the case of, um, um, Later on this week, we're gonna do a case with a bo little boy with a brain tumor. The remedy was given every hour, the 24 hour around the clock. That would, if I only published that case, it would give you a completely different other picture. It has to be individualized. And I think the fundamental rule have been honed down to be very, um, they're logical, they're easy to follow, and they're very, uh, 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 they're practical, and, they're, and they bring the, the best result. It's, you adapt your pulsology to every patient. As long as the patient is getting better, you can wait. If you lose the momentum, though, of the healing response, you don't need to wait. Probably you, need, you can go forward again. Okay, that sounds good, thank you. Um, so it sounds like also, um, not only the, um, for, the, for the future practice of homeopathy, it's really important that the people who interpret what some of the great homeopaths, how some of the great homeopaths have practiced, it's really important that those people interpreting what these homeopaths are doing are publishing accurate uh, interpretations of what they're doing, yeah. and not just generalizing. No, but also they have to understand the context. Yeah. They have to understand the context of their um, of uh, where it comes from, the context of pathology, where it is, where Lipe was, and what happened. But if Lipe was here today, I'm sure they will agree exactly what we're doing. Right. right? It's we are working in a continuation of what. What the, they, they left us, and he was, he worked on the continuation where Alan left. Alan left in the 30th, even though he was working with 200. And he also left the 50 millisimal, but people like Pierre Schmidt that try the higher frequency first, because he was not aware of the, the 50 millisimal, uh, uh, he didn't try it. He, was, he learned how to use a higher frequency like his predecessor. Then when eventually in the 50s to 60 with Kuntli, they, 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 they prepared the 50 millisimal, they didn't get the same response. Uh, they, they, they were not satisfied. And I tried them, it's not that satisfactory. Okay? Very good. 